the technique of glass blowing is thousands of years old. It hasn't changed much. The tools haven't changed much. And it's basically the idea of putting air into glass, expanding a bubble, and shaping it. So we use raw material in the tank to make the glass. This is basically how it comes. It's soda lime glass. And then we also use recycled glass. So when something doesn't work and it's clear, we'll recycle this portion of the glass back into the furnace and use it again. So glass is silica, basically. It's sand. It's raw material that is found in the earth. Soda lime glass, like the kind that we use, is called a soft glass. So the basic blowing process is really just to gather glass on the end of the pipe. We want to maintain as much heat as possible. We might use the marver as a way to cool part of the bubble before we add air to it. Because what we're looking for is for one part to not expand, and we want the hot part to expand more. We start blowing air into it and shaping it. So we're gonna get another layer on top of this so we have enough glass. You have to wait for it to cool, otherwise it'll be moving all over the place. The key to glass blowing is gravity, heat, and rotation. Those are the things that you're constantly thinking about. The glass kind of wants to be a round form because you're moving in a circular motion. It's similar to ceramics where you keep things on center, but it's, it, the orientation is different. The glory hole is the heating chamber. Taking some action on the piece. When it starts to set up, you go back in and you heat it some more so you can do the next step. So it's this constant back and forth with heat and cooling all the time. We create the bottom half of the piece. And because the piece is attached to the pipe, we don't have access to the lip or the top of the piece. So we transfer it to the punty. It's a solid pipe with a hot layer of glass. And we stick that to the bottom of the piece. And then we knock it off. That way we can heat the top of the piece or the lip and start to form and shape that. You'll notice that a lot of sculptural work is done with the hot torch because you can heat a little small area and concentrate the heat so that you have the ability to kind of manipulate the glass in that area. All glass is annealed. Glass has a molecular structure and that structure is stressed out if it cools too fast. So the idea is almost like relaxing. If we were to make the piece, set it on the floor, it would explode. So we put it in the annealer, it sits there overnight, it becomes stable, and when it's cool in the morning, we take it out. So the furnace we affectionately call Fernita. She's sort of a character in our lives, and also something we take care of. Like the heart and soul of the operation is this glass furnace that's on 24-7. We have about 250 pounds of glass in that crucible that's inside the furnace. Come to my chamber. <laughs> this is our color cabinet. All of these are color bar. This would be an opaque blue and this would be a transparent blue. When we're adding color, there's a multitude of techniques and this color is super dense. Every color that we have, we make a sample of and we hang it on this wall because in the bar, it doesn't always look exactly as it looks after it's blown up. They change with heat. This is what's known as a collar. 
So I'm gonna make a little glob of glass at the end of the pipe and it'll be sticky and that's what we'll pick up the color with. I mean, color, you know, is intuitive, but it's also scientific. The art of making color, you know, whether it's in painting or in glass, is all about things from the earth. So there's a, a lot of colorants that you can put into glass, like gold creates more of a ruby. There are metals, there are oxides, all kinds of things that are added to glass to create color. These guys are fruit wood blocks, generally made out of cherry. They're soaked in water and they create a steam layer and they come in graduated sizes. So depending on the size of the piece that you're making, you would start with a smaller size for less glass and a larger size for more glass. These are a great way to start your bubble. Hello? Off. Hello? Off. So the blowing notion is really about what you're making. And it doesn't make any sense to blow into a cold piece of glass. <laughs> the blowing happens when the piece is really hot and you're working with a partner. You're actually explaining to that partner what you need. Blow. The whole thing is about communication. I mean, Jen and I have worked together for 16 years, and so our dialogue is a non-dialogue. Let it hang a little. No more air. No, I think we're good on air. That whole choreography, that's a dance that we have done a million times together. It's kind of automatic. Good? Yep. The frustration with glass is that you can't touch it. As a sculptor, as like a maker, you want to touch something or feel it. The closest thing is this wad of folded up newspaper soaked in water, and as we use it, it gets this carbon on it. There's like a layer of steam that just form in between the paper and the glass, so you don't get anything stuck to the glass because it's so hot. You can almost feel like you're touching the glass. These paddles, you can see, have been burned in on purpose. Once there's carbon on the paddle, the wood will stick to the glass. The wood is nice because it doesn't absorb the heat. If we're creating a bottom and we want to be able to work it, we could use a metal paddle, but that would suck the heat out of the glass. So this is a way to protect the person from the piece. These are called jacks, used for pulling, shaping, if you were to lay it on the bubble. There's wax on these that keeps them sliding. Water is essential to the process. We're cooling our pipes in the pipe cooler so that we can touch them because they're getting hot. When we're transferring the piece from the pipe to the punty, we'll put a couple drops of water on that jack line. That creates thermal shock so that we're gonna get a break right on that line. Form and function and choice are all related. When making sculptural work, you're deconstructing an object and constructing it in glass. When we're making the flowers, I've kind of broken down the idea of how those things are made in nature and I'm trying to reconstruct them. When I'm making those, Jen is bringing a bit, and those bits are in different kinds of shapes depending on what we're making. With the magnolia, they're like a flat. And I'm literally just applying that bit, cutting it off, and then I'm shaping it. I'm trained as a sculptor, and that's where everything begins. 
I've been making sculptural objects for a long time and think that when you're a maker, you make things to keep your sanity. You're compelled to make things. I think one of the things I like about it is that when you begin something, you have to finish it. Like you can't put it down, walk away, and take a break. You gotta stay focused. For my personality, that's a really helpful kind of characteristic of working with glass. When I'm creating a sculptural work, I'm thinking about how I want light to impact it. Light creates the mood for just about any space, and to have something that is both beautiful and functional that, you know, casts this gorgeous light in a space is really magical. That's what makes a space a space. I think it's sort of like a muscle. You do something enough times. It might even just be the way it feels. It's kinesthetic as much as visual. We're starting to really appreciate things that are handmade. There's a story about the making. There's a story about the ideas that went into it. There's experience. The things that people make, you know, are forever. Thank you.